Say hello to one another and find somebody you don't know, make it a point and introduce yourself. Good morning, friends. How's everyone doing? Awesome. Welcome to ECC. My name's Justin. I'm one of the pastors here at ECC. Uh, really, really glad you're here. I think you're here for a reason. 
Um, and we are, we have some really great worship and teaching in store for you uh, this morning. So welcome. Uh, by the way, if you see new faces, uh, we want this to be a place of hospitality. We want it to be a place where, look, it's really hard to go to any place, anywhere new, new restaurant, uh, new gym, new anything. Uh, and that's true of the church too. Like, uh, it takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of um, verve to, to go to a new place and meet new people, and you don't know what, what's going to happen. So let's make sure that we, we are a place of hospitality and welcome and warmth for people who are just uh, checking us out and, and exploring. Uh, in your bulletins, uh, there's a communication card. Uh, we want to get to know you. Uh, if you're new, help us out. Do us a favor and uh, fill this out. Give us a name, an email, or a phone number. Uh, so we can begin to get to know you and, and be in contact about newcomer uh, events uh, coming up. This is also a great, great way that you can let us know how we can be praying for you. If you have prayer requests or comments, uh, put those on your communication card and uh, drop those in the place uh, on your way out. Next, Soup Sunday. Um, uh, we have a, a series of fundraisers. Uh, the youth are raising money for... Uh, a, a conference called Unite. Uh, it's a, an amazing sort of annual conference. Uh, that's going to be after this service today. You can uh, fellowship with us uh, over soup. You can also support our youth um, through um, our Soup Sunday events. And we're going to have several in March as well. So keep an eye out for those, typically after second service. Uh, so join us for that. We've got an Esther class coming up. This is next Sunday. So this is the last Sunday that you can sign up for this. Uh, you can sign up. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the Connect desk out there. It's a little s sign. It's going to be a three-week class in the book of Esther. It's a, it's a book study, three-week Bible study. We're going to be meeting next door uh, at the Lifehouse on Sunday mornings during second service. So you can come and worship first service and then join us for that Bible study, adult Bible study uh, during second service. It's going to be an amazing uh, three-week study. So join us for that. Sign up is at the Connect desk. You can also sign up on the, your Church Center app if uh, you have that on your phone. White Lake Men's Ministry, March 2nd. Uh, it's the 7 a.m. This is for all you men out there. Um, uh, we gather at North Grove Brewers. Stephen Kelly uh, is a kind of uh, a known radio personality. He's got a background in radio, and he's got a great story. He's uh, going to be sharing that and, and over coffee and conversation on March 2nd. That's the first Saturday uh, in March, 7 a.m. at North Grove uh, Brewers. Check that out. Um, if your schedule is like anything like mine, it's, it's, it's full to the, to the very edges of the page. <laughs> and, and you're constantly scribbling more things in the margins because there's no space. And you're thinking about the next thing before it even happens. So even right here, it's hard to be present. It's hard not to be thinking about the next thing that we're going to do after this one. Um, but God calls us to be present. He calls us to be present because it's only in, in that presence, in that still, that's probably God right now. Um, <laughs> it's only in the stillness, it's only in the stillness that God can, can speak to us and cut through the noise. Our lives are so noisy right? Our lives are so noisy. So let's, let's be present. Let's be in the moment. Let's be where we are this morning and see what God has for us. Let's continue with our call to worship. This morning's call to worship is from John 1, 32 through 34. Read along with me. Then and John, John gave, gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. We're going to take a couple of minutes like we do each week. Um, think about that scripture and go to God in prayer. So let's take some time and this is your time.
Do whatever you want to 
the generation that seeks you, God. We pray that we are humble. We pray that we lift our hands to you, God, in praise and worship and thankful for the way that you've met us here this morning. Um, we're just uh, excited and expectant about what we're going to learn today about you, God. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. So as you're sitting down, we have a couple people I want to introduce to you. First of all, our speaker this morning is somebody you probably know. Um, usually he's sitting back there playing drums or uh, um, greeting you. He's a super positive guy. Um, and uh, we were blown away for a service by this guy's teaching. So Tom Beatham's going to come up and teach in a second. We're excited about that. But before that, we have Tracy Holland who's going to come up and give a powerful testimony. Um, wow. Listen to this. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, I like that. <laughs> um, thanks for giving me a moment to share my story with you. Um, every Christian I know has a story about how they came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So this is just my story. Um, at the time, I was going to church with my parents. I attended a Sunday school class that usually had like six or ten students in it. <clears throat> this particular Sunday, I was the only one. And I was 12 years old, and I was given the, the choice to either join the younger kids or have a class by myself with my teacher. And I thought I was too cool for the young kids, so I chose to have my own private class. And, uh, you know, this was the, I had grown up in church for a long time, um, my whole life, and I always knew in my head that this is what I was supposed to do. Um, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. Um, I couldn't accept Jesus with my heart yet. I wasn't ready. But I know I was um, really, um, obsessed with this one hymn song, and I loved it. And I even bargained with God. I'm like, God, if you just play this song, maybe I'll be brave enough to walk down the aisle and accept you into my heart. This is a Baptist church, and their tradition is, you want to accept Jesus, you walk down in front of the whole church and you tell everybody. It was terrifying. <laughs> and I would, um, I love this song. I'd play it on my flute over and over again. I used to play a flute. And uh, you're not really supposed to bargain with God, but I did it. And um, this Sunday, and in the Sunday school class, I finally realized that um, if I was the only person in the whole wide world, Jesus still would have come and died just for me. And I finally understood and opened my heart for the first time to my Lord and Savior. And told the, my mom, I told the pastor, and then church service started afterwards. And lo and behold, during the, the altar call, they played that song. And I walked down the aisle and I told everybody. And God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to. I was already all in, you know. He just did it to let me know that he heard me and he loves me. <laughs> um, the, the, the hymn was, The Savior is Waiting. I don't know if you know that song. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? I love that song. <laughs> um, so anyway, I grew, grew and grew, of course. Um, went to high school, and then I went off to college. Uh, I could have picked really any college I wanted to go to. Uh, we lived in San Antonio, Texas at the time. My, my dad was in the Air Force, and I went to this large public um, high school. My graduating class was 848 students. And... Um, Without even trying very hard, I graduated number 17 out of the 848. And, and I could have had my pick of any university, really. I could have gone to the University of Arkansas because my parents wound up moving to Arkansas right after I graduated. But I didn't. I went to Southwest Texas State, it was called. Now it's called Texas State University. They changed their name. Uh, why did I do that? To follow a boy. That was uh, mistake numero uno right there. <laughs> Um, <laughs> while in my junior year of college, I was contemplating applying for medical school. I had all my paperwork filled out, tests taken, volunteer work completed, everything. 
<clears throat> but I was torn. Uh, to go to medical school would mean leaving behind that boy because he had already had plans to go to pilot training for the Air Force. And so I prayed about it, and I remember it so clearly. I went to a worship service for a, crusade, a campus crusade for Christ, which is a good organization for all you college kids. <laughs> um, and I remember the Holy Spirit very clearly telling me that I should go to medical school. And that's the first time since um, becoming saved that I remember hearing his voice so clearly. But I didn't go. <laughs> I thought I knew better. I was like, yeah, I heard you, but whatever. I have other plans. Um, pride got in the way. I thought I had a better idea what was the best path for my life than God did. So I didn't leave that boy. That was mistake numero dos. <laughs> we wound up getting married, and we divorced three years later. My plan was not better than God's plan. And I, if I would have just listened and obeyed, I would have saved myself a whole lot of heartache. Um, because I ignored the Holy Spirit, he was pretty silent in my life for some time. Um, I kept making my own choices and made a lot of mistakes. I often mistook his silence for the green light to just do whatever I wanted. Um, I wound up joining the Air Force myself and met my husband, Scott, by the grace of God. And <laughs> we've been married almost 21 years now. Um, we have three children. And um, I almost messed that one up, too. We, we were in Idaho. Scott was stationed there. I had gotten out of the Air Force by that point. And um, we were having some trouble. And I remember thinking, well, this is never going to work. I'm just going to leave. And I, again, remember feeling the presence of God because I couldn't physically leave. Like, I wanted to go. But I felt like, you know, the best way I can describe it is, like, there were angels there with flaming swords, like, blocking the doorway. And I just could not go. And I thought, well, fine, I'll stay for a while and see how it goes. Um, we wound up moving here to Michigan, and I never left. I am so thankful. We wound up going to church regularly, Scott and I. Um, I bought a devotional, started reading my Bible um, almost every day. And then I finally started hearing the Holy Spirit speak to my heart all the time. I could ask questions and get answers for direction in my life and whether or not I should go help somebody or go visit somebody or participate in something. And every time I listened and obeyed, um, I could hear that voice getting stronger, and I felt blessed when I obeyed. Um, so God, God continually points out my flaws, and he's slowly molding me to be more like him. And I recognize how prideful I have been. Um, I seem to be naturally good at a lot of things, won some awards and recognition for different stuff. Um, but, but I was always trying to gain the praise of men. I think it's wonderful if you do the best you can at things uh, for the glory of God, but not, not just to be better than everybody else, and that's what I had tried to do so many times. I was so foolish and prideful. So now, it doesn't matter to me if my children are the smartest or more th most athletic, or talented. I only care if they have a heart for God. And God delights in using the weak things to do the mighty things in his kingdom. And I now have incredible peace in my life, even in difficult circumstances. My children are growing up. They're now 17, 15, and 9. The oldest one's a senior this year. She's about to graduate and go off and do great things. Um, you know, and it's funny because, you know, I, uh, most parents probably are like me. We have, like, an idea in our heads of what we think our, parents, our kids should do and a little plan for them. And, and uh, now I'm maybe my senior, instead of going directly to college like I thought she would do, she's going to go probably, um, she's still thinking about it, but she, she'll probably go on a mission with uh, Youth with a Mission. It's a great organization. Um, and I remember thinking, yeah, but what if she never makes it to college? What if it changes her whole plan? And a wise friend told me, well, maybe it's supposed to. You know, God's way is better than your way, right? I'm still learning, right? <laughs> um, it also wasn't my plan um, for my husband to get ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's.
with me. <laughs> um, he, he hears my prayers. In fact, every time I pray, saying, God, I just need some encouragement, I'm feeling bad, he sends someone every single time. <laughs> and I'm so thankful for that. Um, there's been a lot of wonderful people in this church that have reached out to us. And it's taught me um, the kind of person I want to be. Um, giving sacrificially and with love and enthusiasm. And I think back on all the times where I didn't do that. You know, I just went on with my own life. And that's what I've learned is that I want to be more like the other people who have shown me so much love. Scott and I are pretty independent. It's been hard accepting help in absolutely every area of our lives. Um, I've also learned that I'm not always a nice person, you know. I don't always care for my husband with a good attitude and with a smile. Sometimes I'm selfish and whiny. But <laughs> I pray that the Lord teaches me how to be joyful in all circumstances. And I still have a lot to learn, I'm sure. Um, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. That's in a song, too. <laughs> um, he has shown me over and over again that he's faithful, so I will keep trusting in God, reading his word, and listening for his voice. And I hope you do the same thing. I don't know all the answers. I'm not that know-it-all high achiever anymore. <laughs> I'm in desperate need of my Savior every single day. And maybe that's right where I should be. John 3.30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. Amen. Let it be so. Thank you so much. We just got to bless these people that we love. And so I'm glad. I think he's doing like baseball or something down south. It sounds amazing. Um, so anyway, we're gonna, I'm going to try to fill a hole in the series in Mark that we've been covering. And Tom gave me a, a smaller passage which I was thankful for in Mark 7. Um, before we go any further, could we just stop and just pray for God to work? I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you already for a truly wonderful time together this morning. Thank you for the songs that you have given the church. Thank you for the prayers. Thank you for the testimony. Thank you for the fellowship. Father, as we yearn to learn from your word we just ask now that your Holy Spirit would be at work in this place, that it would be, he would be at work in all of our hearts. We ask that you would supernaturally open us up to what you have. I am uh, completely unable to do anything profitable here apart from your power and grace. And we as listeners, Father, we completely depend upon you to work in us. So we ask that you do so. 
In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. All right, so the, the title of today's message is Give Us Pure Hearts. You may have heard that line uh, in the song we did earlier this morning. I love that song. Music team, what a great job this morning. Um, <clears throat> so before we get into the passage, I just want you to know that I did a good job last night of um, getting really clean. Um, I showered last night. I want you to know that. Um, I washed my face. I shampooed my hair. I cleaned my ears with a Q-tip, which some doctors say you shouldn't do that, but you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> so even if you looked inside my ears, they're looking pretty good. Um, I cut my fingernails and my toenails for today. So I'm, I just want you to know that I am a clean specimen today, okay? Uh, some of you that might make some of you feel better about this, uh, might make myself feel better. And if all this talk about my shower and cleanliness seems random, it is. Uh, this is the most bizarre introduction to a sermon ever, probably. But it's going to make sense as we go, okay? So just kind of take that and tuck it away over here for now. And we'll dive into this passage of Scripture. Mark 7, verses 1 through 2. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Uh, these Pharisees that are coming from Jerusalem and gathering around Jesus, that sounds kind of nice, like, let's gather around and listen to Jesus. That's not what's meant here. This is probably a commission sent out of Jerusalem to find out what Jesus is doing wrong, how he is teaching falsely, and how they could trap him. So Jerusalem is kind of like headquarters for the Pharisees, right? Um, and the issue here is not hygiene. It's not about physical things like physical cleanness. It's about religious cleanness and purity, ritual cleanliness. That's what they cared about. So we continue in verse 3. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of of the elders. Would you say that last phrase out loud with me? The tradition of the elders. That's different than the word of God, right? Uh, when they come from the marketplace, oops, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, Kettles, they scrub behind their ears. They use Q-tips. I'd like to show you this verse next and see if you have read this before in your Bible. Cleanliness is next to godliness. <clears throat> I've never read it there either. I think if we ask the average American, they would say that it is in the Bible, um, but it is not. And so I gave it to the, the uh, location, Second Opinions, chapter 2, verse 3. <laughs> I think the Pharisees would have loved this saying, right? Um, and Pharisees get a bad name for a good reason, but in one sense we tend to villainize the Pharisees because they're always doing things wrong. But in another sense, we need to understand the Pharisees were in large part like the evangelicals of today. They held to Scripture. True, they screwed up on that sometimes. But they held to Scripture more than some of the other Jews did. And so we have that in common with them, which makes their failures 
an even bigger warning for you and me. We would never want to name our church a Pharisaic Covenant Church, right? But we as evangelicals have to be careful. Um, but traditions, they, in this case, they're holding to their traditions. They're not holding to the scripture, inscripturated word. And traditions can be super helpful, right? Uh, communion once a month at ECC. Anybody think that's a good tradition? I do. Uh, baptism at the beach. Do we have to do that at the beach? No. Is that a great tradition? Yes. Christmas Eve service. Does the Bible say you have to do that? No. Is it a good tradition? Yes. Right? Um, announcements at the beginning of the service. Do we need to know that information? Yes. Is that a good thing to do? Yeah. It's a good tradition. I think it's a good idea to use microphones. <laughs> You'd never hear me. Uh, or big screens. Nowhere does it say to do that in the Bible. These are traditions. Traditions can be good. Uh, but traditions can be slippery. Right? They can start out good. And then they can go places you never intended them to go. And that's where I say the Pharisees, they're not all bad. The Pharisees did this thing where, okay, here's God word, God's word. God's word says to be pure and clean, richly clean in the Old Testament. So if God wants us to be clean, let's put a fence around that so that we won't even get close to being unclean. Better yet, Let's put another fence. Now we're really safe and clean. Why not just add another one? You see what happens? So now we have this tradition that becomes like godliness. What happens if you cross over that fence? Have you sinned? What about this fence? God never put those fences up, so we have to be careful, right? Um, but you can at least respect the Pharisees' desire for purity and cleanness, even if they get all kinds of stuff wrong. Um, this is not a script. These fences are not scriptural. They are tradition that is held religiously, pun intended. There were Old Testament rules about clean and unclean things, but these men seem to be taking things way too far. Washing cups, washing pitchers, washing kettles, scrubbing behind their ears. Not to kill germs. The Bible would support a good hygiene, so there's other reasons to wash your hands, right? but not for religious cleanness. So, this gets worse before it gets better. <clears throat> Verse 5, So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? If you are a rabbi, Jesus, if you are God's teacher, surely your disciples should at least rise up as high as we do in our practices. And the fact that your disciples are slackers and they don't care about being clean and ritually pure tells us you're not from God. And Jesus if, if I can say it this way, you could start to see the blood run up into Jesus' face. And he's getting mad. He's going to have some words to say, right? So there are two reasons in the Old Testament, as far as I could see, as far as the commentaries I read said, two reasons that you might wash, you should wash your hands in the Old Testament. One, if you are a priest and you are going to be going into the temple to sacrifice animals, then you had to wash your hands first. So that was just for priests, right? The other one was, and this is kind of gross, uh, if another person had a bodily discharge, 
that you came into contact with, whatever that was. You should wash your hands in that case. How many instances did I just give you for when you should wash your hands? Two. How many instances do you think the Pharisees had? <laughs> Man, I should have said that better. Right, so there's the problem, right? Fence, around fence, around fence, around fence. Uh, the Life Application Study Bible says the Pharisees had added hundreds of their own rules and regulations to God's law. And then they tried to force people to follow these rules. There are still religious leaders today who add rules and regulations to God's word, causing much confusion among believers. So here's two quick applications. I haven't even gotten to our first point, uh, but hang with me. Number one, what we learn from this is do not impose your man-made laws on other people. Be very careful about that. You think something is right or wrong, it better be based upon scripture <laughs> before you impose that on somebody's life. Because what the Pharisees would do is they would weigh people down with these burdens. Do this, don't do that, do this, and it's getting heavier and heavier, and Jesus hates that. So be careful that you are not a modern day Pharisee. On the other hand, be careful that you do not allow other people, even religious teachers, radio preachers, television preachers, or your spouse or your children, to impose man-made rules upon you and you to take them on like it's gospel truth. You have to know the word well enough to know whether it's really God's word or not. And if it's not, you got freedom, baby, right? And if it is, you better obey it. But watch out for Pharisees. And when I was a new Christian 30 years ago, uh, I had a little bit of a Pharisee in me. You'll hear an instance of that a little bit later. So I, I probably still do. May God continue working on me. Okay, let's pick up in verse 6. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. Can you see the blood rising up to his face? As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. What's the problem? They worship me in vain. Why? Because their teachings are, would you read these three words with me, merely human rules. Jesus is not cool with that. And then even worse, you have let go of the commands of God, the legitimate commands of God, and are holding on to human traditions. So as evangelicals, people that hold the gospel very high, people that believe the Bible very strongly, we are tempted toward these things. We have to be careful. Uh, David Garland, a Bible commentator, wrote <clears throat> many years ago, and by the way, before I read this, please know that there's been years in my past where I was technically a Baptist. I served a Baptist church. Uh, I have time there, okay? So I can make fun of us. <laughs> many years ago, a professor who taught at my seminary was challenged on his teaching concerning a particular belief. He overwhelmed his critic with passage after passage from the scripture to support his point. The critic refused to yield, however. In frustration, the critic exclaimed, that may be Bible, but that is not Baptist. 
That's getting things backwards, correct? So no matter what denomination of believers you are, the Bible should stand outside and criticize our denominations, not our denomination criticizing the Bible. That's a different form of Pharisaism. Uh, God's law higher than tradition, our traditions that we come up with. So, may ECC always reject insisting that people obey man-made rules. At the same time, may ECC always hold firmly to the Bible's teaching, no matter what. At this point in the sermon, we're going to take a quick break for me to try to equally offend all of us, okay? including myself. Uh, here's some religious rules that we should be on guard about. When singing hymns, three verses max. We should only sing hymns. We should only sing contemporary songs. We should never sing a song that repeats a lot. <laughs> we should always sing a song that repeats. You shall never wear jeans to church or shorts. Never, on the other hand, should you wear a tie or a suit or a dress. Services should never be under 60 minutes. But God forbid if it goes over 75. <laughs> Christians should only read the Bible in the New International Version, in the English Standard Version, in the King James Version, in the New King James Version, in the New Living Translation Version, in the New Revised Standard Version. Those other versions, they should rot. You should never go to the movies. Or, Christians can go to the movies, but it must be PG-13 or less. Or G. Do they even make G anymore? They can only go if it is a Disney movie. They must not go if it's a Disney movie. <laughs> you should never listen to non-Christian music especially not the Beatles, or any music that may have been contaminated at some point through someone listening to it who once knew someone who was related to somebody who was a demon-possessed person. <laughs> you should not listen to that. Now, I knew a Christian university student who felt that you should never have pepperoni on your pizza. And this was because of a religious conviction. I knew a Christian who believed that no one ever should work on Sunday. They must not have thought about pastors. They probably didn't think of emergency room workers. And I'm ashamed to say, 30 years ago, the person I'm talking about was me. And I got mad at my, my girlfriend at the time because she worked on a Sunday. And I was a new Christian who knew everything. Now, all of these issues can actually have some legitimate concerns. All of these issues can have, shouldn't maybe be legitimate concerns, depending on the context, right? But Pharisees don't get to call the shots on that stuff. God's word gets to call the shots on that stuff. And a person who is wrestling with their conscience to figure out how does God's word apply to that is doing the right thing. But when you read the commandment to honor your father and mother, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? There are God's commands, and then there are traditions. And they must be kept separate to some extent. We need discernment, wisdom, godliness, holiness, love, not 
rigid legalism. In other words, yuck. Jesus is disgusted when we impose our man-made laws on others. This makes Jesus sick. Don't do it. <clears throat> Talked about Jesus, the blood moving up into Jesus' face, but do you think Jesus ever uses sarcasm? We have to be careful with sarcasm because we are not the divine son of God, right? Like our sarcasm can be biting and, and inappropriate. Jesus uses it well. And he continued saying, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. Where did Moses say that? The 10? Amen, right? And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. This command's pretty important. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. All these fences have been built up around God's commands, so now there's so many fences, they can't even do the commands of God anymore. That's a problem. So what is this korban thingy majiggy? Uh, I did some research because I wasn't sure. Duval and Hayes explain. Here in verse 11, a son declares his property to be korban, meaning that he bequeaths it to the temple at his death while retaining control of it during his life. In effect, and this is the reason why Jesus censures it, Korban deprives the man's elderly parents of financial support from their son. In the words of T.W. Manson, a man goes through the formality of vowing something to God. Oh God, I give you this vow. I give you this money. I am pledging this money to you and nobody else. So spiritual. Not that he may give it to God, but in order to prevent some other person from having it. This son does not want his parents to have access to this money. He wants to retain control of this money while, while his parents live while he lives, and he can still use it how he pleases, but it's devoted to God. Jesus is disgusted with this. This korban is not in the Bible. This is pure tradition from the elders. Fence, fence, fence. Eugene Peterson tries to Put this in contemporary words. Honor your father and mother. But you weasel out of that by saying that it's perfectly acceptable to say to father or mother, gift. That's the korban. What I owed you, mom and dad, I've given as a gift to God. Thus relieving yourselves of obligation to father or mother. God is like, I don't need your stinking money, and I do want you to take care of your family. So this is a stench in God's mouth. Like, he hates this. Stop using me to look spiritual and disobey, <laughs> is what the Pharisees were doing. And it made me think, how do I do that? <clears throat> So the Pharisees used God as an excuse to avoid helping their families.
Number two, oh, did I miss my, uh, okay. So thus you nullify the word of God, that is honor your father and mother, uh, by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Yuck. Jesus is disgusted when we use our traditions as an excuse not to love. How do we do this unintentionally? Because I don't think most of us would do this on purpose, honestly. But unintentionally, uh, we could get so busy in church life and serving at church that we neglect our families. We could give so much money to a radio preacher, because they ask a lot, right, that we don't have enough money to take care of mom and dad or our kids. Or we don't spend time with our neighbors to help them. And this is, uh, this is where I felt convicted by this message. We have a young couple that lives right across the street from our house, and they've lived there at least a couple years now. Uh, really sweet people. And I've had it in my heart that I should invite them over to do like a barbecue or to have them over for dinner. Um, the problem is, is that I have my own traditions. And here's a couple of them. On Sunday, I'll probably do this today, but maybe I'll step out. Uh, go home after church, eat lunch. Amen? Take a nap. Amen? Uh, get up and pet the dogs. Maybe walk the dogs with my wife and kids. Uh, then, maybe dinner. Then, uh, maybe watch a show. Then, pet the dogs. Then, there's work tomorrow, so bedtime. That is the tradition. I love it. On Monday, I go to work. I come home. I'm home. I teach school. So, I'm home about 4, walk the dogs. Uh, wife gets home, we do dinner, uh, love to read a book together, watch a show together, then what? Bed. This is, my, this is how I roll. When did I invite my neighbors in there? You know? Like, I'm going to have to step out of my normal routine, and I'm inviting you as my church family to hold me accountable on this. Uh, so I just feel like we should have them over for dinner and get to know them. That's it. And, and uh, why I've not done that yet, just shame on me. But that's an example. So what are your traditions? What are your routines? What are your habits that prevent you from aggressively loving people around you? As, you know, for many of our younger people, it's just their cell phones. Like, have, take the tradition of scrolling for three hours a day. Let's throw that in the garbage, right? Um, lots of things. And so the Pharisee is not too far away from Tom Beatham. Might not be too far away from you. God help us, right? All right, picking up in verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone. And to understand this, this is a, a change of focus now. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Why is he saying this? Well, earlier we talked a lot about washing pots and kettles, washing hands, ritual purity, get cleaned up. Um, but what happens if a person is really clean on the outside and their hearts are dark and black and stink like a graveyard? 
Ugh, that's just a creepy thought. And what does Jesus look at? He's looking into our hearts, so he wants to refocus this whole discussion. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. This is going to be really encouraging for them. Are you so dull? He asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body, and we won't talk about that. And then in parentheses, which is so ironic, in this little parenthetical statement, Jesus completely reverses Old Testament practice on food. Earlier in the series in Mark, we saw, Pastor Tom told us that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Remember that? So is it okay to break off the head of wheat and eat that on the Sabbath day if you're hungry? And Jesus says, go ahead, because I am the Lord of the Sabbath. That was a big deal. Adjusting Sabbath laws. Now we're seeing that Jesus is Lord of of the scriptures. And so all scripture from Genesis to Revelation is God's holy word. Amen. Amen. Yet at the same time, the law of Moses and the Mosaic covenant with Israel is now come to an end. That covenant has been fulfilled by Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the end of that covenant. Uh, says the New Testament. And now a new covenant has come with Jesus. And so lots of the Old Testament laws that were intended for Israel no longer apply to the church. All scripture is God-breathed. We just need to understand it correctly, right? And so the food laws, Jesus just said, those no longer apply. The unclean foods, the clean foods, eat this bird, don't eat that reptile, that's done. And so these Jewish people could have pulled pork. And they probably want barbecue sauce on that, right? Uh, the only way to eat it. They could have pepperoni on their pizza. The times have changed. There's a new covenant now with Jesus and his church. Many of the laws of the Old Covenant come across to the New, like uh, the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the New Covenant. Uh, people struggle with the Sabbath thing and how to understand that. We just talked about Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. But so many Old Testament laws were for Israel, and they are not for the church. So now Jesus is going after a different issue. Not just traditions of the elders, but he is helping us reinterpret scripture now. So, yes, finally we get a positive one, right? Yes, Jesus shows us the true direction of things, inside, out. He starts inside and he works out, rather than outside, in. This is good news for us. In, in one way. So he went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within. Oh, hold on. Before I go to that verse. <clears throat> Everybody, buckle in. Okay? Jesus has some truth for us that we're not going to like, I think. This is not a good picture of who Tom Beatham is. This is not a good picture of who you are. Uh, what comes out of a person is from within, out of a person's heart, evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, which is like wanting to hurt people, right? Deceit, which is lying. Lewdness, envy, which is like coveting. Slander, arrogance, and folly. 
Theologians have a word for this. It is called depravity. I need to understand, you need to understand, that our hearts, left to themselves, are depraved. It's like, it's like a graveyard in there, right? And it's a discouraging thought. So all these evils come from inside and defile a person. There's going to end up being good news here, but this is not it. Um, now I can understand the appeal of being a Pharisee because I would rather not talk about my heart. I would rather not open that door and look at the stench in there. Let's keep that closed. And I'm just going to wash my kettles. At least I can do that. I cannot change this nasty heart of mine. God help us, right? Yikes. Our hearts are depraved. But God can change that. One pastor that's well known named Kevin DeYoung, he has a phrase that he likes to use and he says, I am trying to give you a low self-esteem. And of course we have a, a high self-esteem because we're created in the image of God. Amen? But we do need a healthy, low self-esteem when we consider our hearts. We need that. It's biblical reality. But God can change that. So our final point is yes, what humanity has always needed, a new covenant that brings a new heart. You, my friends, live under, if you're a believer in Jesus, you live under the new covenant with Jesus. And uh, we have 10,000 reasons to be thankful that we live under the new covenant. One of them is that the heart issue can actually be dealt with. The ESV study Bible says, throughout scripture, the heart refers to one's being, uh, one's being, including the mind, the emotions, and the will. When it talks about the heart, it's not really thinking of biology so much as just the center of a person. And that's what Jesus wants. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Now, um, I want to show you first one verse that predicts the coming of the new covenant before it got here. And that's pretty exciting. So Jeremiah, if you want to look it up later, Jeremiah 31, verse 31, uh, predicts the new covenant that would come. And Ezekiel, what verse is that? Third, 36, 26 also predicts the coming of a new covenant. This was before Jesus came. Here's good news. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Pause. We tend to think of flesh as a bad thing because we tend to think of the Apostle Paul, right? Uh, in this context, flesh is being used in a positive way. Um, the contrast is with stone. Stone doesn't beat very well, does it? A heart of stone? God wants to take that out, and he wants to put a beating heart of flesh in us. And that's his work, right? That's only God can do that. Um, and so, thank God for this covenant promise. I want to read you uh, this quote from J.C. Ryle. He's an old school preacher, and you got to love those sometimes. Right? 
The wickedness of men is often attributed to bad examples, bad company, peculiar temptations, or the snares of the devil. It seems forgotten that every man carries within him a fountain of wickedness. We need no bad company to teach us and no devil to tempt us in order to run into sin. We have within us the beginning of every sin under heaven. Do you believe that? Charles Spurgeon agrees. Sin is not a thing ab extra that comes to us and afflicts us like robbers breaking into our house at night. But it is a tenant of the soul dwelling within us as in its own house. Listen to this imagery. This evil worm has penetrated into the kernel of our being and there it abides. Sin has intertwisted itself with the warp and woof of our nature, and none can remove it but the Lord God himself. As long as the heart remains unchanged, out of it will proceed that which is sinful. So what do we need? A brand new heart. And that, uh, again brings us back to this beautiful promise here. Give you a new heart. I will remove the stony heart. I will give you a new heart. This came when Jesus came. And this came especially when Jesus died on the cross for sinners, taking our place. Jesus was buried in the tomb. Jesus rose up from the dead three days later. Jesus ascended into heaven where he sits at the Father's right hand. And from heaven, Jesus sent down another helper to be with us forever. Who was that helper? The Holy Spirit. Spirit. When did he come down? Pentecost. You remember the story? And so that is when Ezekiel was fulfilled. That is when Jeremiah was fulfilled. And we get... A new heart. So uh, I said to you guys at the introduction of my sermon that I'm a clean specimen. I took a shower. I clipped my nails. I did my ears, blah, blah, blah. But I'm here to tell you the good news is that Jesus has changed me from the inside out. And I am still messed up. My heart is still corrupt. But I'm telling you there's a new power in there and it's the Holy Spirit, and he has not left me the same. I am different than I used to be. And it's no credit to me. It's all credit to God's Spirit, and I think you know what I'm talking about, right? So, and I will put up my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That's what's going to happen when the Spirit's in you. You'll want to follow God's good rules. Not make tons of fences, but to obey God's heart, right? All right, here's how it is fulfilled in the New Testament. I think I've got two or three verses, and then we're done. Look at how beautiful this is. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Is that good news? Next. John, Jesus preaching, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his what? Heart will flow rivers of living water. Remember the list earlier that talked about what came out of the heart? Now look what's coming out of the heart. What's the difference? Now this, the the rivers of living water, now this is, he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. When did they receive it? Pentecost, right? 
Good news. And here's where we end. Instead of hatred, greed, bitterness, sexual immorality, lust, all kinds of wickedness that comes out of this graveyard, the Spirit has come in, and what does he produce? Uh, let's read all of this verse together out loud, okay? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So me talking about how often I wash my hands just sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? God changing our hearts sounds amazing. Let's pray. Father, do we thank you today that you offer your new covenant believers in Jesus change, a new heart. You take away our old heart. You give us a new heart transplant. Thank you. We ask, Father, as a church, that you would help us to learn how to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. More and more, help us as a church to focus on issues of the heart. Help us to minister to the hearts of people with the good news of the gospel. Help us to pursue change from the inside out rather than trying to change the world from the outside in. We ask that you do your cleansing work in us. Give us pure hearts, Lord, and give us clean hands. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thanks for being here this morning, everybody. Well done, Tom. Thank you, Tracy. Have a great week. Have a great week of worship. We'll see you next Sunday.